Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Science Faction. The only show where a scientist, a comedian, and a comedian scientist come together to discuss science. Comedically. Hello, and welcome to Science Faction 351. Science Faction, the origin of free will. This is like of the movie Free Willy. Yes. Like now the whale's an adult. No, the kid is an adult. Yes. But the the downside is that movie cover where he's standing on the isthmus and the whale jumps over him and he touches it. He's too tall now. He gets hit by the whale. It's going over. (laughs) It's not pretty. It is not pretty. Also, uh, the whale eats him afterwards. (laughs) (laughs) Just blood in the water. Yeah, absolutely. And I, of course, am your host, comedian archaeologist Robert Timothy. With me, as always, is my comedian, Mr. Damian Mercado. Damian, how you doing? I'm doing great. Correct me if I'm wrong, but there's never been a, a, a recorded death by Orca, at least in, t- in the wild. I don't know. I, I don't know. They certainly could at, kill us. At SeaWorld, I think it has happened. Yes, yeah. they definitely have happened in but SeaWorld. I don't think in the wild. They're smart enough to recognize that humans are not their favorite prey, and they go for I, other things. I think, yeah, we don't have the same Plus amount we'll of... punch them in the nose when they yeah, come But to... here's the thing. I don't know. I got to check that, that out. Help. It would not. Big. Yeah, <laughs> I, I have to check that out, because I feel like orcas are also just fierce hunters. We always, like, we give we have the Shamu image of them, but they're pretty fucking brutal. And so, like, I would not be surprised if a couple of Eskimos got dragged into the deep. <laughs> well, I mean, barring the revival of Megalodon... Uh huh. They are the apex predator of the sea. Nothing, they really are. Yeah. Nothing beats them. Yeah. They're the ace of spades. Especially since they figured out recently how to start killing great whites, and they've been doing that, which is an interesting story we covered on Science Faction, where seemingly this is a new technique that we haven't observed before, and we observed them starting to do a similar technique in New Zealand about 10 to 15 years back, where they would grab stingrays and flip them over. And because of the way the very ancient fish system works, stingrays are actually in the shark family. And because of the way their ancient system works, they basically fall asleep and they can't move. So the orcas would do this thing where they'd go underwater upside down, grab a stingray fin, flip right side up. So they were flipping the stingray upside down, hold it until it was basically frozen, and then they could eat it without getting stung. And then shortly after that, they started doing that to sharks. And so we think they kind of learned this technique and then started doing it to sharks. And now what they do is, and we've observed this off the coast of California, they'll hit a shark real fast, going really fast, like a great white shark. And they'll flip them over and then hold them by their pectoral fins upside down. And then they'll eat out their liver and then just let their body float away. Like they're like, fuck it. We don't even care. We're not doing this for food. This is for fun. Yeah, orcas are pretty brutal. I saw a video not too long ago of like, a pack of orcas attacking this, I think it was a gray whale and a mm, calf, yes. which are like much larger than the orcas. Oh, yeah. But they just uh, were very persistent in separating the mother from her calf and like forcibly breaching the calf and turning it over so it would literally drown, like yes. submerging its blowhole. And they did this. The mother was fighting frantically to prevent it. They They managed to kill this thing finally, and they just like – take a few bites of its fat and then just bounce because they were kind of just doing it for fun. And that's the other thing. Unlike great whites, which you could think of as like a a cougar or a large cat, the orcas hunt more like a wolf pack. Like they're going to come at you with a bunch at once, which is why they're such an apex predator. And speaking of the apex predator of science faction, we have none other than our scientist for the evening, Dr. Troy. Dr. Troy, how are you doing this afternoon? Doing good. It's always great to be in here. I got to say, I love learning about science. I love um, discussing science. Uh-huh. Uh, but actually doing science is quite a bitch. And I had uh, a shitty week in lab, Long I week. say, where I had several 12-plus hour days. Oh. Um, so it's And nice your 12-hour just... days, unlike mine, you don't get to see the sun when you have a 12-hour oh, day. Yeah. yeah, I'm uh, isolated from windows. I'm yeah. working with bacterial cultures uh, in a laboratory. Don't but... call your coworkers that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when you said, like, bad day at the lab, and I know, I know you work in genetics and stuff, so, like, I just immediately pictured, like, just mutant spawn being born. Like, well, I had to euthanize 12 mutant babies yeah, today, man. He's like, what a hard day at the lab. And we're all imagining him, like, bent over a microscope. But in reality, he's got an AR-15. And he's just taking out goblins. <laughs> Another hard day at the lab, honey. That's just science. <laughs> I mean, I'm working with the mutant spawn of bacteria. That's what I actively do is evolving them and trying to study how they mutate and develop new phenotypes. And, of course, for our audience, remember, we are changing our intro bit in the next few weeks. So send us your suggestions of what our new intro bit should be. You can tweet us at Faction Science. And when you get bored of that, you can come on out and check me out at Nerd Night, the first Tuesday of every month at 32 North Brewing, 6.30 p.m. The last Nerd Night was super interesting. We just did it last week. We had a talk on flying cars and the psychology of getting you hooked on video games and what alcohol does to your brain. All three of which were incredibly interesting. So very, very fun night. Come on out. Talk to those scientists afterwards. It's like a TED Talk. It's like being part of Science Faction. You can actually talk to the scientists, including at one point Dr. Troy, who did a, did his own uh, nerd night. 
Yeah, I can vouch that it's a fun time. I did the one before this last one. And uh, everybody gets a little bit drunk by the end of the night, and they're like, all right, tell me the real deal, scientists. Where are the aliens? I think a little bit of booze is a great compliment to science in particular. Yeah. Because, like, scientists aren't the best at socializing, certainly. Mm -hmm. I can, I can yep. vouch for that. And the booze really helps you interact with the public and stuff. It's great. You're a traditional Ben Franklin scientist. <laughs> In that you have syphilis. <laughs> and that you're going to be crushing it into, into your 70s. And I like kites a lot. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's move on to our origin bit, the origin of free will. I love this one. Uh, I got to say, I actually came up with this as an origin bit about a month ago and was really excited about doing it. And then I realized I actually really wanted to do it with Dr. Troy because I am interested in his opinion on a couple of the facets of this discussion. And so we held this specifically for this one. I think this is going to be a really good one. I'm going to start this out, though, with a little diversion, because this is actually the answer for me to this question. But it's one that I propose to science educators whenever I meet them. And Will I, you marry me? <laughs> <laughs> Neil deGrasse Tyson. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I always present this because I think this is the question that every honest science educator should be able to answer and answer sincerely, which is... What is the scientific knowledge, be that a broad study, a specific piece of factual information, a general consensus by the scientists in their field, what is the scientific knowledge that goes against a strongly held personal belief that you have? I use the example of this free will thing, which we're going to discuss in a second, as being the thing that I have such a hard time making compatible with my own personal beliefs. But I want to ask this question out to Dr. Troy. Dr. Troy, what would you say is one of those things where science directly contradicts a strongly held belief that you may even still have or at least did have when you learned it? Yeah, I can think of a couple things because certainly I think science is all about being objective and just going where the mm -hmm. data leads you. Which, and by certainly... the way, is why I think this is a great question for science educators because yeah. you ask it like – I'll just throw this out there. There's a, a famous guy who has a TV show and a, a podcast and everything. He has a show called Adam Ruins Everything. And he actually does a decent job with a lot of science education. But he's just, just him kicking sandcastles and everything. Yeah, but it just does happen to be a coincidence that every single thing he quote unquote discovers or finds out coincides with his strongly held political beliefs. And if you listen closely to his show, a lot of times he will say things that's factually untrue, but supports his political beliefs. And so I always find those people, I'm like, mm, I don't think you're doing real science education at this point. So Dr. Troy, what is your answer to that question? Yeah, so I have a few that stand out just as like, when I heard that data, it made me think like, oh no, that's not right. That right. study's probably flawed because I don't believe that like going in. Mm -hmm. um, and really as a scientist, you when you have that first impression, you take a step back and be like, wait a second, I'm not being objective. Yes. I need to evaluate the data and come at this in a different way. So one was, I knew from just my personal life experience, I am not subject to the placebo effect. Okay. If I like, like when I had my wisdom teeth out and they gave me pain pills, I was like, these aren't going to do anything for me. And they like did not. I probably have the anti-placebo effect. We've <laughs> talked about how it, like. That's still a placebo effect. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Yeah, I mean, In a but, way, you're, like, you're actually very susceptible. <laughs> if somebody handed you oxycodone and you're like, nothing. Yeah. But yeah, so I heard like people can take sugar pills and have an effect. And you tell them it's a sugar pill yes. they're taking. And it still has a beneficial effect. And I'm like, that's ridiculous. How can that be a thing? Mm -hmm. And the data are pretty clear. Like, I just have to accept this is an aspect of human physiology and neurology yes. that I am not personally subject to. You are. It is, you well, are. Okay, in, a, in the same <laughs> magnitude and sign of other people. Yeah, we were just talking last year. One of the biggest science news stories of 2018 that didn't get nearly enough coverage was the differential effect of placebo based on an individual's personality type and how, you know, certain people feel the placebo effect more strongly or less strongly and how I was saying this is huge news and nobody's noticing it because this affects our ability to do random samples and to do any kind of placebo controlled study because if you imagine there's a bell curve of the, the susceptibility to placebo and you know most people are in the middle now that means that a certain percentage just by statistical chance of double blind experiments will have a bunch of people on one of the tail ends of that placebo curve that are therefore more or less susceptible to the placebo effect and that will alter the results. Again, on average it won't, but in specific cases it would and that would change that p value of 0.05 to something else depending on, you know, whether or not you had a random distribution of placebo affected people. Yeah, so understanding sort of the distribution behind it and how people come in different types mm -hmm. really allowed me to just accept it. Yeah. Because, um, I, you know, as a scientist, you got to follow the empirical data. 
Um, another thing I can think of. Hold on, maybe... Dr. Troy, would you be willing to do an experiment with us where we tested your placebo abilities? Yeah. That's I think that would be really interesting. <laughs> Like live on air? Yeah, I'm gonna, like, gi- I'm gonna give him mushrooms and see if it works. Are you gonna drug me? Yeah. yeah. What's, how does this work? Uh, we're gonna, we'll have to think of something, but let's uh, let's well, let's it, think of a good uh, research. I love research design, so let's think of a good a good it, experimental it could, yeah. design. Give me a pill at the start of the show. Yeah, yeah. And be like, this is either a psychedelic or yes. a placebo, and like see how you feel. I feel like something a little bit more mod- moderate, like caffeine, would probably be a good way to do it. You I know? have a crazy high ta- caffeine tolerance. Oh, okay. That's that's actually another thing. So my, I'm a weirdo in uh, grad school terms in that my preferred caffeine uh, delivery uh, vehicle of choice is not coffee. It is diet Anima. soda. Oh, no. Well, first of all, that doesn't make you unique. Every scientist I've ever met has a Diet Coke sitting on their desk somewhere. So like... But what does make you unique is if you actually don't drink coffee in, in addition to that. I have since adapted to coffee just from okay. the fact that, like, at conferences, that's your only choice. Yeah. Um, but, like, I'll drink, like, a gallon of Diet Soda a yeah. day, honestly. Um, Coke and Zero or Diet Coke? I just prefer, like, Diet Pepsi or Diet Dr. Pepper. Oh, um, well, but Bobby, I'll, Bobby, you I'll have settle a problem. for whatever. Uh, <laughs> CZ is the way to be, son. <laughs> there, was, uh, there was a study that came out a couple years ago that – I, I was familiar with the research into artificial sweeteners mm-hmm. and like aspartame is yes. one of the most heavily studied molecules on the history of the planet. Yep. And we have like very definitively shown that it's not uh, detrimental to your body. You Huge literally... end sizes for decades yeah. of people drinking massive amounts of diet soda. Yeah. And it just makes sense. You don't metabolize it. Yes. It just literally passes through your body. Um, but there was a study a couple years ago that showed actually artificial sweeteners can have significant negative impacts on your microbiome. The gut microbiome. Even, yeah. yeah predispose you to a diabetic state. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was like, whoa, I, I don't want to believe this. Yes. So my default instinct is to not believe this. I had um, a similar effect <laughs> to the exact same story you're talking about. And I was the one who did the kind of justification thing where I looked deep into the science and I was like, oh, but what they're saying is it makes you more susceptible to later sugar intake. And so if you're still moderating your sugar intake, your gut microbiome shouldn't be that affected. So I'm fine if I drink a gallon and a half of Coke Zero. Yeah. Yeah, I also, I dug into the paper and I was like, all right, this is pretty definitive that artificial sweeteners are doing this, but they tested a number of artificial sweeteners yeah. and it was like the more recent quote unquote natural ones. Mm-hmm. They're like stevia where yeah. they're like, oh, derived from a natural source. Yeah. Those caused a much more detrimental effect yeah. than just like aspartame, which is synthetic, but you can't market aspartame as well. Cause yeah. it's not like, oh, derived from some natural source. Right. So the artificial sweetener that like drinks are now leaning towards more heavily there's more evidence that is bad for you and so i nowadays try and stick to aspartame based uh yeah diet sodas but that's that's just another thought i had where like you just have initial reaction to hearing some data you're like no i don't believe that yes that's wrong yeah but and it, you got to do your diligence you, and examine you, it and you have to take your emotions out of it that's the big thing is to understand you have these predispositions to recognize them and when you get that feeling of i see this data and no i don't like it to be able to recognize that feeling and then kind of step back a little bit and be like let's take the ego out of this and look at the objective facts I don't have that. For the last six years, I've been a co-host on a science podcast and uh-huh. regularly. I, for the most part, I think I'm pretty good at knowing I don't know anything. Yeah. And so when new stuff comes along, I might be like, oh, shit, that affects me. Like, for example, when, if, when we talked about how aluminum foil uh, can have a negative uh, effect on uh, uh, cooking. Yeah, like you don't – you shouldn't – you actually shouldn't cook on the grill in aluminum foil. Yeah, it, uh, it leads to Alzheimer's. Like, well, as a barbecue master, I'm fucked. It just yeah. makes me like more aware of the shit that's coming down the pipe because it's like, well, what am I going to do? Just cook corn without, right. <laughs> without tinfoil? What am I, an asshole? Right. So th- this is the question that I ask. And if somebody were to re- reverse it and go, yeah, well, what is your answer to this question? I can say without even hesitation, the free will argument. So this is something that when I first came across it, I actually came across it from the other side, from compatibilists like Dan Dennett, who were arguing, you know, we do have free will. And then that made me research more into the uh, other arguments, the determinist arguments, and realize like, Holy shit, not only philosophically do they write, but a lot of the neuroscience seems to back up the determinist model of free will. So let's take a step back and talk about exactly what I'm referring to. So we have a concept of what we call free will, the ability to make choices, to make the decisions. Philosophically speaking, it kind of gets more narrowed and honed down to the concept that you could have made a choice other than the choice that you made. So today... Uh, Dr. Troy could have not shown up to Science Faction Studios, but he did show up and he made that choice via his free will. That's the philosophical concept of free will. I've lived my life 
with this as a foundational belief of how I act, how I expect other people to act, the idea of responsibility, the idea of, you know, taking responsibility for your actions. And you should go to jail if you do something wrong because you have done this wrong thing and you chose to do it. And all of these things are part of my current beliefs, including the idea of punishment, which is basically completely dependent to some extent on free will. And all of that is an integral part of how I personally view the world. And so when I started getting into this free will area of study, it really made me like uncomfortable, like literally like I felt squirmy and uncomfortable at the notion of like, fuck, my worldview might be completely wrong if I objectively look at the facts. Well, what are the facts in terms of free will? You need to find a place for that will to come in. Right, Because assuming that you do not believe in some kind of dualism, meaning that the, there's some soul that is separate from who you are, assuming that you're a materialist and you believe that our personalities and who we are and our perceptions and everything are contained within this organ we call a brain that is within our body and all of that follows mechanistic processes of the natural universe – and that it was all set up and started with, i.e., somebody gave you the hardware, your brain, right? You were born with this brain. Somebody gave you the firmware, things like your heart beating and uh, natural reflexes. And then somebody gave you the software, meaning you incorporated a bunch of stuff from your natural environment and then used all the stuff you learned by seeing and hearing and tasting to Loving then- parents. Uncle molested you. These yeah, are all firmware everything. that can be uploaded. Viruses can be uploaded. All those are software, yes. The software that can be updated. Uh, all of that determines kind of what you do, right? So every time I am doing anything from deciding to say a sentence to getting drunk and running over a kid in my car, it is- my, the combination of my brain's hardware, firmware, and software that is just acting out the same way a computer would. If I programmed a computer, built it, set it up, programmed it, and then put a question in there, it's going to output an answer. It did not choose to output an answer. It output an answer based on preset conditions that exist within that computer and its programming. It didn't make a choice. I put in two plus two. It threw out four, it could not have thrown out six because it would have to have different programming to do so. And once you start looking at the human brain that way, it's hard to find a place for free will. Where does free will come in? How can you have a choice if your brain was just, you know, your brain has the physical structure it has, it has uh, the firmware that's in there, it has the software that's in there. Do you ever really make a choice or is it just a computer that takes a bunch of inputs and spits out an answer? So I have strong opinions on this informed by my physics knowledge and my uh -huh. biology knowledge. And I'm actually not really – like this doesn't cause me consternation okay. to think of uh, free will or not because I'm very strongly of the opinion that if you had a supercomputer that knew the laws of physics and knew the quantum state of every single particle sure. in your body – um, it could simulate you perfectly, yes. and that would be equivalent to you. Yes. You can do thought experiments like your brain is trillions of connected neurons. What if you replaced one of those yeah. with uh, a you know robotic neuron that just mimicked the actions of the neuron? What if you replaced all of your right. neurons sequentially with those? You're still the same person. It's life, I view, is we're like a computer running a simulation. We are a neural net that has been evolved through billions of years of evolution yeah. and trained through every experience you've had over the course of your life. Yes. Um, the sensory data changes how your neural net is structured. So it sounds like, if I can interrupt you, that you don't have any concept of free will or a problem with not having a concept so if, of free will. If you, so I am of the opinion that there is determinism. Yes. Like you can, if you have perfect information, and yes. that's a very important word yeah. you throw in there, perfect. You cannot have any lack of information right. whatsoever. But if you knew the quantum state of every single particle. Yeah. If you, you, if you put Heisenberg theory, aside and you knew the vector of everything. Yeah. And yeah. You could, in theory, say exactly what someone is going to do. And yeah. so from moment to moment, I think if we rewound the entire universe um, one day, nothing is going to cause me to not come to this show. Yes. Clearly, I'm at this show now. Yep. My molecular state caused me to make this decision. Yes. Uh, even though I experience the qualia of making decisions. Right. And, so and you I, couldn't have done it any other way. There would have been no situation whereby you couldn't have come today because it wasn't a choice in the sense that we are kind of conditioned to think it is a choice. We'd go but, back into the Troy equation and we would take him out of his loving household and put him in a foster home. Yes. And then I think there's a good chance that the equation might wind up a little differently <laughs> yeah. today. But yeah, I think free will is a useful emergent property to discuss. So if you get into fundamental basis of reality and yes. what we're made of and how everything in the universe works, there is no notion of free will. That's just not mm -hmm. there. Uh, and I don't think that's that concerning because at a higher level – at the level of humans and societies, clearly there's free will. I don't think there you could find a single person on the planet 
who would say they've never made a decision in their lives. But that, like, but have they actually yeah, made a decision? So when, I think when you get down to the physics, you would say no. But there are so many things in the universe that are emergent and not in the fundamental physics, like temperature. Temperature does not exist in fundamental physics equations. Wait, you go how, how into so? The, it's because it's just a collective property of atoms and their energy. So yeah, the, but it's a, the, it's the energy state of any given atom, right? Yeah, but so like the the def, the equations of quantum field theory that tell you how an atom will move uh, uh -huh. when exposed to various forces. Like there's no temperature there. It's this emergent property when you're suddenly dealing with collections of atoms that temperature leads to really crazy things like phase transitions mm. and all sorts of complicated stuff. And so I think free will is sort of just once you, once you get a neural net of sufficient complexity, because really the human brain is the most complex thing we know of in the entire universe. Right. I mean, we have built things like the Large Hadron Collider, which is the most complicated machine ever built by human beings. Yeah. It required millions and millions of man hours of work. It's ridiculously huge and complex. It's nowhere even like orders of magnitude close to the complexity of a human brain. Sure. And I don't think people need to realize how when you add in combinatorial stuff, the number of possibilities for things just get so complex that you can get this crazy complexity that leads to new things. So like- But you, are you saying that there is free will in that complexity? Because to me, that just means it's a more complex computer program and you're still not making a choice. So it, I think it really gets down to semantics. I fully recognize I am a collection of atoms obeying mm -hmm. the laws of physics. Yep. And if you want to say like, okay, a, an all-knowing supercomputer that knows the state of every atom of my body can predict my future actions, that means I don't have free will? Sure. That's not the definition I like. The definition I like is I experience free will. I have qualia and like I make these decisions. And so I think- But do you actually make the decisions or is yeah. your brain actually just computing something and then tricking you into thinking your, your consciousness made the decision? Yeah, it's, uh, when you get down to it, yeah, that's essentially what's happening. But I, I don't think it matters. Like that's also why I'm not concerned. Like I could be a simulation in a computer. Sure. Very much because I think- I'm just a collection of atoms yes. obeying the laws of physics. You simulated me in a universe simulator um, where you just modeled all my atoms. There would be some experience of myself having qualia and well, experiencing but, things. But now let me bring up why I have a problem with this. So now if what we're saying is we're all computers, we're following the laws of nature and stuff. Imagine we have three computers lined up here and we inputted two plus two and the first two popped out four, but the third one, because on the way up here, we had dropped it and it damaged some of its circuitry, it outputted six. Now, do we torture that computer? And then is that that different for what we do in terms of people's choices and how we treat them when they make negative choices? Yeah, so that I think that's a good point. Like I still despite recognizing that people are just at the whims of physics and you are just obeying the laws, all of your, the atoms in your body, I still think people should be held accountable for their actions. I do too, but I have a, fi a hard way around that. Now, there are certain things like if somebody murders somebody, they should go to prison. And it doesn't have to be we're punishing you for your actions. Part of it can be we just need to deterrent. remove you some, from society, right? Yeah. And keep you away from other people. And, or like you said, a deterrent for other people who have it. And what we're doing is essentially saying your brain is broken like that computer. And because of that, you're a danger to society. And we should remove you because your brain is broken, not necessarily because you made a choice. I'm okay with that in terms of removal, but then it gets into a weird place of punishment. And I believe in punishment. It's an inherent part of my personality that I think people should be punished for bad actions. But if they didn't actually choose to do those actions, is that a moral thing? Or am I torturing that computer for my own self-interest? Well, if, if you could teach that computer a lesson, by the way, the whole thought experiment of like torturing a computer is, yes. is funny to me. I'm picturing like- uh, I think players. there's a few black mirrors on it. Yeah, well, I was picturing prison guards like uh, uh, turning off the virusware and like going to like <laughs> Russian websites yeah. on an internet explorer. <laughs> How do we reconcile the idea of actual punishment if it's not for you know future improvement, if it's punishment for punishment's sake in terms of things like prison or whatever else, how do we justify that with the idea of non-free will? Yeah, I've had that thought. Like with there are death row inmates who, you know, have been on death row for 20 years. Yeah. And then by the end of it, they have clearly done a lot of reflection and like recognize that what they did was terrible. And they're kind of essentially a different person now. Yeah. And they like wouldn't have made those decisions anymore. And I, I think at that point, if you could be assured that they're not faking it just yeah. to get out of the death row. Um, Punishment serves no purpose. Yes. Like it's, they, they are literally a different person. They would not make those decisions. And yeah, they were at the whims of their free. Like I fully recognize, even if you don't buy into like your atoms are just always obeying the laws of physics and 
fully determining what you do. You were born with a certain set of genes that yeah. predisposes you to things. You were born in a certain environment. You were raised in a certain yeah. environment. All of those drastically affect how you develop, how your neural net, you know, which is a meat computer, yep. develops over the span of your life to make certain decisions. And we say decisions, I think that sort of evolved as a way to rationalize things where since the earliest, you know, microscopic organisms, you need to take in sensory input from the universe as a whole and process it and make decisions. Even, you know, microscopic little worms. C. elegans is a uh, microscopic roundworm that is a nice model organism for the brain because it only has like a few thousand cells in its whole body and its brain is like 300 neurons and yeah. we've mapped all of them. Yeah. Um, and we think like one of those, part of its job is letting the roundworm recognize itself. Like it sees its tail hmm. and it's like, oh, that's not food and that's not a potential foe or anything. That's just part of me. So I know how to treat that, kind of just ignore it. And that provides the basis for further evolution that like, oh, I recognize that I am sort of my own thing apart from the environment and then forming more complex models of yourself in the environment. And if you're going to make decisions like run away from bad stimulus and go towards good stimulus, you're sort of forced to adopt a worldview where like I have choices and I have actions. Are you? Because that is that is another question that brings up. Is this a necessity to be what we are? Do we need to have an illusion of free will to make those decisions? Because that computer doesn't, right? That computer doesn't need to think that it is making a choice to say two plus two is four. It just needs to access what two is, what two is, what the combination is and make four. And so couldn't we have evolved in such a manner where we wouldn't have this illusion of free will? I think it's the kind of fuzzy thing that just as you get more and more complex, there's no like clear line where you're like, this is free will, this isn't. But I mean, you look at pets, you know, like cats and stuff, mm -hmm. they make decisions and can seem to regret them, like, you know, jumping mm -hmm. on a vacuum and accidentally activating it and then being like, oh shit, I shouldn't have done this. And they remember to avoid vacuums in the future because they had a traumatic experience. This is like just part of being a living organism and there are selective pressures to... But you can Act recognize a decision is bad without having to think of that decision as being made as free will, right? You can be like, uh, trial A failed. All right, trial B, you know? Yeah, but so I think we, humans are certainly at the level of complexity that we think we have free will. That uh, That's everybody's experience. Yeah. But only cats truly have free will. <laughs> but yeah, we can't really speak for lower <laughs> animals, but like I wouldn't be surprised at all if even like dolphins or chimps and stuff, they have complex thoughts like that they can probably have some level of free will i'm again i'm saying I, I need to stress i think we're all just atoms obeying the laws of physics sure. so if if that's your definition of free will then no we don't have free will but it's a useful emergent description of how the world works and so i don't think we should just say like oh this isn't the thing that happens and yeah. it stems entirely from our lack of information like it is just fundamentally impossible to have perfect information on the state of your being enough so that Quantum teleportation is the action of transmitting a state like particles or yeah. some matter thing from With one Ziggy. <laughs> from that's, one that's area leaps, Damian. quantum leaps <laughs> <laughs> from one area to another and it's fundamentally you destroy the thing you teleport because yeah. to actually measure the quantum state of every single particle in whatever you're teleporting interacting with it changes its state. By the and way, so you have by now, the way, that's why everybody on Star Trek, that's why Scotty was the biggest mass genocide murderer in all of Star Trek. He was killing you every time he teleported you. You are not being teleported, you are being destroyed and a photocopy of you is being printed elsewhere. Sure. I mean that that's true, but also at the same time, like I wouldn't have a problem with that. But your you consciousness would, just resumes. No, it, your consciousness doesn't. An identical it, consciousness resumes elsewhere. You, Troy, are dead. It, you are gone. That, it depends your experience on, no. of qualia no, no, goes no. away. Uh-uh. I, I disagree with that. It depends on how you define it. I would say my conscious system's active running process is me. The actual atoms that make up my body are completely irrelevant. Well, and so if, if you transfer that exact state literally to the quantum level to the fact that you have destroyed the original copy, it is the most identical you can possibly get, I would say that is me. No, it's, it doesn't a, photo, matter. it's a photocopy. I know, but it doesn't matter, though. But what, it's okay, identical. What if we did it without destroying you and we photocopy? But you can't. No, so that's the thing. That's the awesome thing about quantum mechanics. You, It is literally impossible. The act of measuring the quantum sure. state 
actively destroys it. That's why there's only ever one copy of you. But That's why I still think of you it. You didn't you. see the episode with the Riker with the beard. But, but <laughs> I gotta walk there like an asshole now? You're God. also <laughs> assuming that the quantum state is necessary for recreating your mental state, whereas it might not necessarily yeah, be, and you, you might be able to measure it without that, in which case, if I made a copy of you elsewhere, and now there are two of you, then there, it, by definition, you can recognize that that's a separate consciousness that just happens to be identical to your own for whatever amount of time it stays identical. Yeah, that's when you start to get into weird stuff because I don't, I don't think you actually need to literally to the quantum level mimic every particle in a yeah. brain to actually simulate a consciousness. That yeah. would be drastically complex. I think you can get away with just having a model of your trillions of neurons right. connected. But I, I wanted to make this point about combinatorial complexity where a deck of 52 cards, the number of different arrangements in a shuffled deck of cards is if there's only 52 of them, yeah. more than the number of atoms in yeah. the planet Earth. Yeah. And your brain has trillions and trillions of neurons connected in crazy random ways, responding in different ways to different stimuli, having been formed and the connections pruned over the course of your life and all of your experiences shaping it. So it is just so complex as to be incomprehensible to us. And so I don't see any difficulty in something like complex enough as consciousness to arise from that. And sure, when you really get down to it, it's not free will. Just like if we had really, really complex AI running yeah. on a computer, that's just electrons moving around yes. on a silicon chip. It's not, a, you know, that we can map how those electrons are going to move from moment to moment. I think you could have a computer program, you know, complex enough to be a living thing. We know from neural nets now, we can train neural net with just like a really basic few layers of neural connections on data sets and within very few rounds of training, they get so complex that they can do really accurate tasks like identifying images. Uh, but we can't say at all how they're doing that. They have just figured out how to do that. And that's what our brains did over billions of years of evolution. So I, I'm able to take the view both that at a fundamental level, we don't have free will, but also, of course, we're going to talk about us as having free will and we should judge people for their actions because that's how the world works. Yeah, it, it's hard for me in terms of, yes, you should judge by actions because bad brains that are designed poorly or who are that are acting in a poor fashion should be removed from society. For me, the hard part comes with punishment, which is an integral part of my personal belief system that people who do bad things should be punished. But then I get to the point of, wow, is that just some kind of weird sadomasochistic masturbation of this makes me feel good to see somebody else who has done something wrong suffer? I, and I think that's, I, I understand your view. Like I get, I, I kind of like like videos online of some bully gets yes some oh i love those yeah and like that's that's an evolutionary thing yep. we have shown that chimps will literally pay money in the form of food yeah. to watch a like misbehaving chimp get punished yes and, and that's, i would pay, i would give a sandwich <laughs> to watch a misbehaving chimp get punished <laughs> <laughs> uh, by the way, new startup. <laughs> and that's, chimp Fight Club? No, PunishChimp.com. <laughs> <laughs> we'll trade sandwiches like, hey, uh, we, we don't partner with PayPal. We partner with Subway. And what's interesting, too, is if you see we kind of – our brains make it seem as if we did make that choice, right? So our brains give us the illusion that we could have chosen to show up today or not chosen to show up today as opposed to the pre-programming we have. And it works to such an extent that our brain makes up these makes up these stories about us all the time. And to me, the most interesting example of this comes from neurology with what we call split brain patients. So there's these people there. We cut the corpus callosum, which is the part of the brain that connects your left hemisphere with your right hemisphere. And we cut those in certain people who have a form of epilepsy where basically the, the epileptic seizure gets bounced back and forth between the hemispheres. And by cutting the corpus callosum, you stop that from happening and it stops them from having very bad seizures. But there's a lot of negative effects to cutting the corpus callosum, which is you divide parts of the brain that do different things. So there are parts of the brain that, for instance, process a visual field. And, or a certain side of your visual field. And so there are, and then there are other parts that process a certain side of your auditory field. And so what you can do once you cut the corpus callosum is you can talk to a person and give them information to one side of their brain and not the other. And what we can do with that is, let's say we have somebody read something in a fashion that only goes to one side of their brain. We'll have them read an instruction that says, please get up and lock the door. And they'll do it. They'll get up and walk and lock the door. When you then address the other side of the brain and you ask them, why did you just get up and lock the door? They don't say, I don't know, or, and again, they, that side of the brain does not realize it, it was told that. So they don't say, I don't know, or I was told that or anything else. They immediately make up an excuse. There was somebody outside when I walked in, I was a little weird with them. 
and I wanted to make sure I locked the door because it was I thought it, we needed to be safe. Our brain is really good at post hoc making up excuses for our actions that make it seem like we have agency where we didn't. That person didn't lock the door because they thought somebody scary was outside. They did it because they were told to and didn't know they were told. I think it would be crazy if, you know, the people conducting this experiment, you know, they're prepared to write down the results. Um, but there's uh, just people who just say racist things. Oh, like, totally. what oh some Mexicans were outside. Yeah. Hey, there were probably a few of those for sure. <laughs> but it's a it's an interesting like glimpse into the human mind where we just post hoc make up reasonings. Now we do this for other things too. It's not just free will. When we have to explain why we did something that we know is morally wrong, let's say you're a person who believes in environmental safety and care and uh, not destroying the environment, but you just change the oil on your car and you don't want to drive all the way down to the uh, oil exchange place and so you dump it down the storm drain, you ask somebody why they did that and they'll post hoc make up an excuse for it, right? Our brain is great at making up excuses to preserve our mental states, to make sure we don't seem like bad people to ourselves, to preserve an idea that we have or a concept we have of ourselves, even to determine the source of our actions and why we did things. Our brain is really good at doing that. And we're really bad at noticing when our brain does that. I think there are certain people motivated perhaps by self-hate, like myself, who yes. are very, who, you know, like if I poured the oil down, it'd be like, oh, like somebody asked me why. I wouldn't make up a reason like, oh, because I'm a lazy piece of shit. Yeah. And then like, <laughs> I'd go on like, like cursing myself in the shower. That's why like, you're the most evolved one of us all, Damien. <laughs> yeah. Take note. I'm an X-Men practically. <laughs> Self-actualization man. But yeah, so anytime you're going to cause, like, you're going to make the case for real free will, if you want to say, no, 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 I'm making this decision, I could have chosen otherwise, you're going to have to insert some kind of causal mechanism by which they, that choice could have been made differently. And to me, the only people who can honestly do this are dualists who believe that there is a soul that exists outside of their body, and that soul could theoretically then have some kind of nebulous construction that does have the ability to make a choice. Now, when you first found out about this, you said it blew your mind. Yes. Uh, I didn't have that, as I said before, a lot of self-hate. Uh -huh, you know, yeah, I know yeah. I'm always like, well, I couldn't have made that decision any other way because I am broken. And as a broken yes. toy, that is the only decision I could have made, right? But I'm also a firm believer in that if people are the sum of their experiences, you, if you increase the end number, you increase the size of their experiences, if you can raise the average, you can raise the grade point average on that person. If those experiences are positive. Yes. If they're positive and like you're not a psychopath. Yeah. All right. So I, we, we need to change our current prison system away from the current system yes. and into the Star Trek system where yes. they try to actually reform people. And so I uh, want Also known as the Norwegian system. <laughs> <laughs> so I would like all those guys who are super hardcore criminals right now to employ them. By the, you know, to employ them, uh, make it so they don't have to look for a job when they get out. They have a job right now. Yeah. And they're free to go home. And basically their job is scaring shitty teens straight. I do like get scared state, straight programs, by the way. That's another one I get a pleasure out of. It's a little bit of non-physical punishment right now for your shitty actions that yeah. could hopefully curb the behavior in the future. Well, it, it does change my views in how we should run a prison system. It absolutely makes me feel like the Scandinavians have it right, where they basically gear everything towards rehabilitation as opposed to punishment. That is not our system here in the United States. And it is, by the way, a system that I morally feel entitled. I, I feel like we the way we do it is right and the way the Scandinavians do it is wrong. I feel that way in my heart. But this type of knowledge makes me say, I may feel that way, but I think my feelings are wrong. I think we should gear everything towards rehabilitation. I think punishing the computer for saying two plus two is five is not the way to get to a better society. So what do you do? Just put down psychopaths? Because, I mean, they have no chance of yes, rehabilitation. So, that, so that's a different thing. That right now, we yeah. don't have a, re a, a rehabilitation for some people. That doesn't change the ones that we do have the rehabilitation for. Yeah, so sort of informed by my realizations about free will and, you know, we're really just subject to our environment and our genes and stuff. I think if, like, you could magically press a button, let's say some horrible criminal killed my parents brutally, yeah. and it's at the trial, and they're like, okay, as the last surviving heir of this guy's victims, you can choose to kill this guy or press this magic button that will literally change his brain architecture to no longer be a murderer and to, like, regret his actions and be a different person. And, like, my instinct is to be like, fuck this guy. He yeah, just yeah, murdered yeah. my parents. But if you could actually change them into a different person, right. like what is the goal of killing someone is to remove their danger from the population. Like there's the vengeance is not a th And a what do we thing. do with our prison system? We make them worse. We send them yeah. to criminal school. We send them to violent sociopath school. We send them to how to learn how to do bad things. And by the way, we don't do a great job of getting those people college educations and doing other things that will make their lives better when they get out. Yeah. 
Also, one interesting thing, you've brought up a computer saying two plus two is six. Yeah. That's in a properly programmed computer. That's never going to happen. Sure. Unless you get a bit flip, which is literally like a yeah. cosmic ray from space right. coming and interacting with one of the memory units of the chip and changing it. And so that's an important thing to keep in mind with consciousness and free will mm -hmm. and determinism as well, is that like, yes, if we literally rewound the entire universe to yesterday and every single quantum nature of the universe were identical and we replayed it, I would 100% of the time be back in the studio recording this podcast. Yeah. But let's say for simulation purposes, we're just going to rewind the state of the entire Milky Way galaxy. Yeah. Like we don't need to do those other galaxies light years and light years away. That's not going to have an effect. We, let's say we do that. Every state of the particles in my body is the same. Everything on Earth, everything in the solar system, we get bombarded from cosmic rays from other galaxies sure. all the time. And like just by chance, maybe one out of a trillion, trillion times replaying this, one of those will hit my brain and like cause damage in a neuron that now my wiring, like I'm, I was just at the point of thinking like, oh, I'm looking forward to science faction yeah. recording this. And then it changes my perception of it. And oh, like, well, actually, yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to go do hardcore drugs or something. Uh, first so of all, let me just, <laughs> let me just comment, by the way, your simulation was slightly flawed in that those cosmic rays are traveling at the speed of light. So if you took the Milky Way from yesterday and rewound it, it would still include the cosmic rays that would hit you at this point. But secondarily, yeah. that's just a difference of what's causing this stuff in determinism. And that's just an incomplete reset, yeah. right? So all we're doing is saying we're not resetting all the stuff we need to reset in order to get the conditions. Although that actually gets to the fundamental probabilistic nature of the universe. So you mm -hmm. actually could rewind just a day. Yes. And even though those cosmic rays were traveling for billions of years, they were already yes. emi emitted. Um, some things in nature, we've we've learned this in through quantum mechanics. Uh, the initial angst about free will versus determinism was brought up by uh, Pierre uh, Lagrange in the 1800s. It was called the uh, Lagrange's demon uh, that if if it had perfect knowledge of every atom yeah, in the yeah. universe and its momentum, it could predict the future. And, and then Heisenberg came up yeah. and fucked everything. And so now we know as a fact, like nature is fundamentally probabilistic and to certain extents at the quantum realm, like you have a radioactive atom. Yes. I can tell you the exact probability distribution yep. of when that will decay, but I have no way of telling you when it will actually decay. Right. And so, But there's no reason to assume that if you rewound time, it wouldn't still decay at the exact same time that it decayed the first time it went through, right? Because whenever no, but it, it actually, it actually completely could. And that gets into really funky stuff like the wave function of the universe starts branching into multiverses, but like in quantum mechanical calculations, you literally need to take as a real thing that every possibility is happening and you like integrate over all of those. So you, when you make a calculation, like two particles exchange a photon, yeah. you can do a simple calculation on the, like the energy transfer for that. But you, to get an accurate calculation of what actually goes on in the universe, you need to factor in the very small chance that as the photon is traveling between these two things, it spontaneously transforms into an electron and a positron, which then very quickly come back into contact with one another and then create the same photon just going on the same path. And that's a super low probability of happening. Yeah. But in quantum mechanics, like everything that is possible does happen with a certain probability. I would have to see some kind of way for that to have happened differently though in the past, right? Because like if you rewound everything to the same state. So what? yeah, you, you, rewind, you, you rewind the entire universe, yeah. nothing will change. Yes. You rewind a part of the universe and yeah. that it's subject to That's, different forces. I'm fine with that. Yeah. that can, you can, so I've, I've had this discussion with friends, like what if you put a full atomic, like quantum level copy of you, you teleport it in Star Trek mm -hmm. to the same exact environment and you just do this like every hour and expose them to the same stimuli. I would say the worlds that stem from that are gonna slowly diverge over time because there will be some slight random chance that sure. causes like one of your neurons to fire. Maybe you turn left instead of right at an intersection and now you die in a car crash instead yeah, yeah. of avoiding it. And then slowly the worlds will diverge. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Anyway, that gets to, into like crazy stuff. Absolutely. <laughs> so we are in a pre-multiverse universe right now, right? All the Troys would be here. All the multiverses Every of Troys would be Troy, here. Every single Troy, except There's for no... the, one, the one that's doing meth, is he's gone, but... <laughs> oh, but, well, that's consistent. Only you only have one meth yes. user amongst the entire multiverse? That's that's a record. They actually, there are, like, a number of competing interpretations of what quantum mechanics means. I mean, we have equations that tell us how this stuff works. We can use yeah. it practically. But even despite 100 plus years since then, nobody really agrees on like what it means. Yeah, Some people it's... say like you observe it and the wave function collapses. And one I'm inclined to believe actually is the 
mini worlds hypothesis. Like every branching of the wave function, every atom that radioactively decays is you now get two different universes where in one it decayed and in right. one it didn't. And and that's okay because that can that can work with with a scenario that seems to make sense. There are other ones like that that have these competing theories that go back and forth. Like one of the things that always bothers me is when people talk about the idea of the universe being infinite, like infinitely large. That doesn't really make sense if it's continue a because it's continually expanding, but b is we could say it's as big as it is but you could still, if you had an, a large enough calculator, compute that size, right? Like we could, for instance, talk about the number of atoms within the universe. That can only be done with a finite amount, right? So the size of the universe actually gets into just one of the features of our universe is there is a causal speed limit. And so yes. the observable universe, everything we can possibly interact with is by definition not infinite. Yes. And it's like, okay, there could easily be universe outside of there. Like yes. maybe the Big Bang was infinite in extent. There was literally, it is impossible with laws of physics to ever, we could send out light as, you know, move as fast as possible yes. and never reach these things because of how fast yes. the universe is. So, so it becomes a practicality thing as opposed to an, a mathematical infinity. Like one divided by three is a mathematical infinity, right? You're going to have Point three 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 three, and those threes will never actually reach an end. And that's an infinity. There's an infinite amount of threes there because there is no end. Whereas no matter how many atoms are in the universe, it's still a finite number. That's still an actual finite thing you can count. All right, let's move right on to science articles. From molecules to particles, this is science articles. All right, Dr. Troy, we got a good one for your uh, for your day here. A uh, very interesting article came out about some very old galaxies we just found. Speaking of the old stuff that's far away, so uh, the yellow younger galaxies that get are on off their my lawn. lawn. So, them the loud rock music. So we discover new galaxies. That's not necessarily an interesting thing in and of itself. What's really interesting is one, the type of galaxies we discovered, and B, their essential invisibility to us up until this point. So. This was the discovery of some very large, very ancient galaxies that seem to kind of go against a lot of the universe formation ideas that we've had before. But more importantly, they allow us to look at things like the supermassive black holes at the center of galaxies, especially because these seem to be much bigger and much further away and much older than we had necessarily anticipated. So let's go into the actual discovery of itself. Why is that so interesting and why did it take us so long to find? So in this case, uh, the previous discussion we just had is actually quite relevant. When we talked about the universe expanding, think about it in the sense of the universe is expanding, but it's not like expanding like you're adding an addition onto your house. It's not like, oh, I'm putting a, an extra bedroom on the end and now my house is bigger. It's more like if you think of a balloon and you're blowing it up and the balloon itself is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. In that same sense, that's what's going on with space. Everything is expanding. What that means is that things like light, which is traveling through this universe, get stretched out as it goes because it's literally traveling through space that is being stretched out. It's a really interesting concept to try and like put in your head, but that light beam is actually being stretched. Almost think of like Han Solo shooting the blaster and that blaster beam like, like getting morphed and getting longer and longer and longer. Or going to light speed. Yeah, exactly. Well, because of that, the light from this really old stuff actually becomes invisible. And so we need different equipment to be able to, to actually register this light and see it. So, Dr. Troy, this is a, a group out of Japan that wanted to look at light that was being pulled out like this. And so they went down to, what was it, Chile, to the Atacama, where they have a big radio telescope to look at this stuff. And what they found was really interesting, which is that there was a bunch of hidden galaxies we didn't know about. So what's so interesting about these galaxies? Yes, yeah, so they, in fact, specifically went out looking for these. And the way we, anything we see in the, like, super far away in the universe is going to be, like, whatever light it emitted originally has been drastically redshifted. And redshifted meaning its wavelength has increased and thus Stretched its, out. its energy has yeah. decreased. And so it's harder to detect. Um, and part of that is, like you said, it is moving through an expanding universe, at least for photons coming outside of the galaxy. So mm -hmm. anything in the galaxy, we are not locally yeah. expanding. So that's not happening there. But extragalactic things, the light travels through and literally expands. But also um, more distant galaxies are moving like faster and faster away yes. from us because of the expansion of the universe. And so there's both the Doppler shift from its 
being emitted from something that's moving fast away from us. And then it has all this travel time where yep. it just gets expanded further from the expansion of space. And, and if so you're confused by what he said about things further away moving faster, again, imagine that a balloon analogy. Imagine when the balloon was really small, I put uh, like five dots on the balloon. Some were really close together, some were further apart. As I blow it up, the ones that are farther apart are going to get a bigger distance apart than the ones that were closer together. Yeah. And everybody's experienced the Doppler shift, you know, hearing a Silent. fire truck yeah. yeah, come towards them. And then when it goes away, the siren sounds very different because yes. the wavelengths are actually shifted of the sound. And the same thing happens with light. But so in this case, we knew there were some galaxies missing. Like there are older galaxies out there, but we knew that they're on um, a milk carton. <laughs> they're <laughs> yeah, they're being their light is being redshifted into sort of invisibility. We don't have sufficient telescopes to detect mm -hmm. these. So they went about looking for one. They looked for infrared signatures that were specifically lacking any sort of other mm. source that they could detect with the telescopes. Uh, and they were like, this is a good, the fact that there's an infrared signature in this small patch of the sky, but we can't detect any other wavelengths. Maybe that's a big galaxy that's giving off heat. So there's some infrared, mm -hmm. but like the actual visible wavelengths have been obscured or redshifted into invisibility. So let's go to a different telescope array that can check these different wavelengths, which is difficult to do, at least on earth. And they were in fact able to find like 39 surprisingly large galaxies that were in, they're like, formed like 2 billion years after the mm -hmm. Big Bang. Uh, we're currently uh, like 13.7 billion yeah. years after. So very early and like surprisingly large galaxies. And dense, right? Yeah. So for these galaxies to form, there needs to be a lot of clumping together of matter. And we think that like kind of happened fairly gradually after the Big Bang with slight deviations in the initial density of the universe causing these seeds where now it's slightly more dense so they yep. attract more stuff. And then eventually you get a whole galaxy and held together by a big black hole. But the fact that we found these larger than expected and older than expected was quite surprising and it's gonna rewrite how we do simulations of the universe. So we're actually just recently have gotten to the point where we can start to literally model a universe, like model a big bang in a supercomputer and say like, how will the matter coalesce yeah. uh, and form galaxies afterwards? And for a long time, we, we've run those and they've been like really inaccurate and they haven't matched what we actually see when we go out and look at galaxy structures. But recently we've gotten good enough techniques that we are starting to mimic the sort of galaxy structures we see. So this was not expected. This is a shortcoming of the model. And so it's going to be able to inform the model better. And it's also exciting because most galaxies are like mostly dark matter. Because dark matter interacts gravitationally. It sure. can act as that seed crystal to attract other matter that then you know, coalesces and forms stars and interacts with the other forces of nature, not just gravity. So there are implications like the fact that these huge galaxies were there super early. Maybe there were just these bubbles of dark matter that like very quickly attracted stuff. It's it's going to, there's going to be a lot of follow-up work on this, but it's exciting and, stuff. And, and, you know, when we talk about dark matter, essentially what we're saying is we know that there is a certain amount of matter in the universe. We can't see it all. We don't necessarily know where everything is, Right. Could this also be a little bit of the answer to that, that we are not seeing a lot of the matter that's out there because we're not seeing entire galaxies up until th times like now? No. So this, we have a number of independent reasons to think that dark matter as some invisible substance, like pervading all of space mm -hmm. is really there. And it's, it's not just like galaxies or things mm. we're not seeing. One is just the rotations of different galaxies. So we, in galaxies we can see that aren't super distant, the way they rotate and their acceleration profiles do not at all match what you would expect if just the matter you could see were there. Mm. Like they are consistent with there's this invisible cloud of really dense matter. And then also there's like imprints in the cosmic microwave background, the leftover radiation from yeah. the Big Bang that shows a certain level of clumpiness that is consistent with some invisible particle there. Interesting. Not interacting through the other forces that is just interacting through gravity. So this, this is not going to explain dark matter. This is just going to help inform our searches for whatever dark matter actually is. And there was another really interesting paper that just came out this week in the biggest physics journal that puts a postulate forth, of course, it's not at all proved, that maybe dark matter is just a particle left over from inflation, which inflation was sort of before the Big Bang. Yeah. We think the inflaton field collapsing was essentially the Big Bang. As it collapsed, that was that huge release of energy. But inflation provided the expansion of the universe up till then. And the thought this paper puts forth like dark matter is this particle that was a remnant of that old field that instead of decaying into particles that we know of like normal matter, 
it stayed stuck as these dark matter ones, and it only interacts through gravity. Interesting. Um, and then maybe this can be combined with the new galaxy measurements to be like, oh yeah, we would expect this density of dark matter particles if this field collapsing was the cause of it. And thus we would expect this distribution of large galaxies to be formed at this certain time after it because it would act as seed crystals. So it's exciting stuff to try and figure out what this dark matter is that makes up a large portion of our universe in terms of energy. Dark matter matters. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm more of a fan of blue matters, the only ma- matter that truly matters. Uh, I, I know it's a big mystery of what dark matters, but is there any theoretical way that you could measure it if you had a... Yeah. Well, you measure so, it based on its gravitational effect, right? Yeah, or there are thoughts that just incredibly, incredibly rarely it will interact with a, another type of particle. I mean, there, we know there are particles and, and forces that are just crazy, crazy rare. The, like the weak nuclear force is the only force by which the neutrino interacts with yeah. other particles. The neutrino is one of the subatomic particles. Bombards particle every part of our bodies. Trillions of them are passing through you right now, yeah. The sun is... But every once in a while, we'll have a huge-ass pool of water buried deep in Antarctica, and it'll interact just slightly, and we can see, like, a photon release. Yeah. But so you send a neutrino through a solid block of lead... Yeah. What do you think the average distance it'll go before it actually interacts with one of those particles of lead is? Uh, a mile. A light year. Wow. An entire light year <laughs> is how far a neutrino would pass through a solid block of lead. Like, wow. this is how infrequently some uh, particle interactions happen. Yeah. And so we have tried to look for dark matter in these really rare collisions with similar ways we detect neutrinos. We haven't been successful so far. We've tried to make it in particle accelerators. We have plans for certain satellites that are going to try and detect it. So we, we're trying. What would the effect be if one of these neutrinos interacted with a water molecule in my body? Would I explode? It, no. So it would be exactly the same thing as probably what happens to you not infrequently when a cosmic ray might hit you, where it probably fucks that cell up and that cell just dies because now it has... Hopefully it dies and it doesn't fuck it up in such a way that it becomes cancer like yeah. you get from melanoma. Yeah. What if so it it's... killed, just by chance, <laughs> killed a cancer cell That would be before? very unlikely. It could, yeah. When it interacts, all it does is just impart its energy onto the molecule that it interacted with. So the neutrino had energy in it, and now, since it has finally interacted, that has been transferred to your molecule. And since it's a decent amount, it has now damaged that molecule. And if that happens to DNA, that can cause a mutation or just, like, kill a protein. Is it like like all of a sudden this semi-truck just materialized and splattered this cell? I I think it, it depends on the energy of the particle, but, like... Individual particles can carry a crazy amount of energy. There's one in particular that's called the Oh My God particle. And it is something we detected. It was a cosmic ray we detected from space. And it was a proton moving so fast, it had the kinetic energy of like a baseball thrown at normal speeds. Huh. Oh this, my God. Yeah, yeah, in this single proton. So if that hadn't hit the detector, it had hit like a body, like that could probably actually fuck you up. But in for the most part, no, you don't get like seriously injured. You imagine just it hits your face. This this interacts with like the very first water molecule on your face, and you're just like, "What the fuck?" You're yeah. just standing around, and you're bleeding out of your mouth. There is actually a case where a guy stuck his head. I'm pretty sure it was his head in the path of a particle beam. Like he was working on a particle accelerator, and like accidentally looked in or turned it on when he was working on it or something. And fortunately, they're so tiny and like in such a concentrated beam. Uh, it didn't really do much damage, but like it technically bored a hole through his entire skull, and and, and now he has all that superpowers. brain tissue. But we know, I mean, that can happen with an iron rod yeah. in the case of Phineas Gage, and you yeah. can still live. So human bodies are pretty resilient to damage. Phineas Gage, he's immune to metal rods and explosions. <laughs> one didn't kill him. Oh man, we got to skip our second one because we're way over time. That was a really interesting episode. I am glad I waited for you to be on to have the free will argument. <laughs> Me too. Thank you, Dr. Troy, for that. And thank you, audience, for coming back for Science Faction 351, where you learned all about the origin of free will and about how the discovery of some new old galaxies might change our models of the universe. Thank you so much, and make sure to join us this Thursday for Science Faction 352. I'm going to go do hardcore drugs. You've been listening to Science Faction. Wait, that's not right. <laughs>